Hallelujah. Amen and amen, brothers and sisters. We continue to make progress in the second edition of the Kingdom Church, and the Lord has been gracious to us, releasing revelation in the Word by His Spirit. And we said that this course is going to be Bible based, going to be Spirit inspired, it's going to be Christocentric. In other words, it's going to exalt the person of Yeshua HaMashiach, the, you know, the way he ought to be exalted because there's a strange Jesus that people are preaching today. A Jesus who is not complete in himself, a Jesus that needs, you know, the pastor, the overseer, the apostle, you know, to be hugging the spotlight with him. A Jesus that you can be suppressed and you're preaching kingdom and he's not there. Brothers and sisters, mm-hmm. the Lord wants us to know the real Jesus. And, you know, example of Paul, he says that I may know him in in Philippians chapter 3, that I may know him. I want to know him. I want to know him, the real Yeshua. I want to know the power of his resurrection. I want to know the fellowship of his sufferings. Be made conformable unto his death. Today's preachers don't want the fellowship of his suffering. They want to just jet around and accumulate a crowd unto themselves when we know him in spirit and in truth we're insured from all the errors of churchianity the new jesus on the block is different from the jesus of the bible the new jesus on the block has a divided body whose parts are in a state of unending bitter strife and competition for membership the new jesus has a bride that does not know and love him and accepts hate as a virtue. The new Jesus is hung on a totem pole for people to have a transactional relationship. If you give me this, I'll give you that. You give me a wife, give me a husband, give me children, give me a house, give me a job, give me breakthrough, then I'll do this for you. The new Jesus is weak. It's not enough in himself. It's not worthy of complete submission. The new Jesus needs the assistance of men and women he called to share the lamb light with him. Brothers and sisters, it is important that we know the real one. And the real Jesus, according to Matthew 11, 25 to verse uh, 27, is revealed by the Father. And Holy Spirit affirms him and the word declares him. The new Jesus, I mean the real Jesus, we need to know. There are a number of dimensions of the real Jesus. And today we look at the dimensions and then go and focus on his offices. Father in heaven, grant us the grace to communicate what you revealed in the secret place. And in previous iterations of different courses, just even now, let Yeshua be exalted and draw us to where he is. For he alone is worthy to be worshipped and adored in his church, in Yeshua's name. Brothers and sisters, taking some materials from understanding Yeshua, Jesus, the Son of God, Son of Man, we look at a few dimensions of the real Jesus, the Yeshua HaMashiach. Number one, he is pre-existent. He has existed in eternity. And when he was manifested in the earth dream, for 33 and a half years, it was only for an assignment. Two, he is the centerpiece of prophecy. From Genesis 1, we see, let us make man in our own image. He was right there. When man fell, it was prophesied as seed of the woman. And then he participated in that decision, let's chase man out of the garden. And in Genesis chapter 11, we see when the people were building Tower of Babel. Say, let's go and see what they are doing. And all through the Old Testament, right to Malachi, it was about Yeshua. The golden thread that held together the entire passages of Scripture is the manifestation of Yeshua as his first as the seed of the woman and two as the coming king. Number three, he is the incarnate Yeshua, the one who lived in a Jewish body for 33 and a half years. That's why we cannot accept anti-Semitism in any way. He is the one. He lived in a Jewish body. He was incarnated as a Jew. Today, there are a lot of different distortions of his identity, and people call him all kinds of names, but he lived in a Jewish body for 33 and a half years for a purpose. Number four, he was a Pascal lamb, the one who came and laid down his life, suffered, died, and rose and suffered, 
you know, for us and was crucified. Number five, he is the reason Yeshua and the glorified Adonai who deserves all worship and he ascended bodily to heaven as Adonai, the conqueror war, one. Number six, he reigns as king and sovereign ruler of those who are called, those who are redeemed by him. He is there. And number seven, he is the supreme king of the one kingdom nation. If you're a believer in Yeshua, you're a believer in Yeshua, we're all part of one kingdom nation. Whether you are in Asia, Africa, North America, South America, the Caribbean, the islands of the oceans, Europe, it doesn't matter where you are. That's why we cannot in the kingdom church accept those divisions of men. We cannot accept it. We bring all the redemptive gifts of the various parts to the table and then Number eight, he's a coming king. He'll soon come. His return is imminent. I want you to take this. This is no longer a manner of speech. All you see happening in the world is getting towards getting the world ready to receive the Antichrist. And because of that, the real church is going to be taken off before the Antichrist emerges. And number nine, he is an integral part of Elohim, the Godhead, which remains wrapped in mystery. Until that day, Revelation 10:7, the mystery of Elohim will be accomplished. There will be no more mystery, and we'll see him as he is. For now, the secret things belong to Elohim. The things that are revealed belong to us that may live thereby. Now, having said that, let me now focus on the 13 offices of Yeshua. Why is it important? If we're going to talk about the kingdom church, we're going to know about the king of the kingdom. If you know him, and everybody should know him, not some, a few people who have secret knowledge, and then they now function as intermediaries between him and people who are ignorant, no. And people are running around them, no. This is what is happening today. We have now great men and women of God who have some secret knowledge, and then they use that secret knowledge and the anointing to manipulate people like crowd around themselves and come and bring them money. No, that's not our Yeshua. That's another Jesus. The real Jesus, number one, offices he has, his creator. If you look at John 1, 3 and 10, Ephesians 2 and 10, Ephesians 3, 9, Colossians 3, 15, and 16 and 17, he is creator. All things were created by him and for him. He was part and parcel of it all. And that is important we understand that he is not a created being. He is part of the Godhead. If you know him as creator, you're going to have confidence in him. If you know him as creator, you commit your life to him. You know him as creator, you will be able to release yourself to him. Number two, he's savior. Ephesians 5.23 says he's the savior of the body. And Philippians 3.20 says our conversation is in heaven from whence we look for our savior, the Lord Yeshua. He's our savior. He saved us from sin. Without him, we are still in our sin. If we believe in him and confess with our tongue, we are saved. Men and brethren, everyone in the church has experienced salvation. If you have not experienced salvation, you are playing religion. Because salvation is the entry into the kingdom. Hello, brothers and sisters. We have looked at the first part of the profile of Yeshua, the king of the kingdom. And listen, no matter what the enemy does, no matter how much he tries to knock off the live stream, we're going to tarry. Winners never quit. And quitters never win. So keep us in prayer. We're going to press on. We're going to make sure that this message goes out. Listen. There are 13 offices of Yeshua. We've looked at the nine dimensions of him. There are 13 offices he occupies. Knowing them will enable you to appreciate him as head of the church. Number one, he's the creator. Why and how? He's an integral part of Elohim. The Godhead is a mystery, the real. One God, not three gods. One God in three persons. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And the Bible records in John 1, verse 3, all things were made by Him. Without Him was not anything made that was made. Verse 10, He was in the world, 
and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. Brothers and sisters, it's so important we receive him as creator because then we have confidence in him. We're going to know why we have to give him right away to rule and reign in our heart and in the church. Ephesians 2.10, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God had before ordained that we should walk in them. Brothers and sisters, he truly is a creator. The creator God. You can also look at Ephesians 3 9 and Colossians 3 16 and 17. And we're told that He is before all things, and by Him all things consist. Number two, He is Savior. Brothers and sisters, we, are, we were sinners like all of humanity who inherited the sin gene from Adam all the way from Adam to our great grandfather to our grandfather to our father, and then unto us but then something happened at the cross of calvary about 30 about 2000 years ago yeshua in his incarnate state paid the price in full at the cross of calvary and shed his blood for us to be saved and anybody who believes that report that he had come from heaven and gave his life at the cross and said it is finished if you believe that report in your heart and confess it with your tongue you are saved why is it important to talk about salvation and the savior because if you are not saved and you are in church you are not part of his church one is either deceiving oneself or just play religion the kingdom church the very starting point is salvation by grace through faith unfortunately people make it a be all salvation by grace through faith is the beginning point and brothers and sisters we cannot say it enough that yeshua is the savior of the world and ephesians 5 23 says for as a husband is the head of the wife even as Christ is the head of the church and he is the savior of the body he is our savior Philippians 3.20, for our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. That office of Savior is essential. Number three, he is our Redeemer. He didn't just save us from sin and we have faith and then we are saved. His blood was the price paid in full to redeem us from the grip of Satan. You see, Adam and Eve, when they ate of the forbidden fruit, you know what they did? They handed over their neck to Satan. The mantle of kingdom rule, they handed to Satan. And they came under the dominion of Satan because whoever you yield yourself to, you become his servant. And mankind has been slave to Satan and sin from the day Adam sinned, Adam and Eve sinned till Yeshua paid the price. Now that price was not just for salvation, it was for redemption. Meaning, he literally, by the shed blood, he gave to Satan to fulfill the just requirement of the Father and to ensure that legally Satan acquired the mantle when he tricked at Eve in the same way legally by the blood that yeshua paid as a price to redeem man buy man back from the lordship of satan brothers and sisters we are told in colossians 12 giving thanks colossians 3 12 giving thanks unto the father which had made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light who has delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear son in whom, that is his dear son Yeshua, we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sin. Redemption is real. We are redeemed. We are no longer under the yoke of Satan. This Satanology, everything, Satan, 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 you know, people are not able to, you know, have their freedom in Yeshua is because of too much consciousness. Yes, the Satan has a work he still does, but He's not doing it from outside. You are no longer under his yoke. He's simply oppressing you. He's not possessing you. Galatians 3, 13, Christ has redeemed us from the cause of the law. Redemption covers that struggle to try to please God legalistically. None of us could do it. He came, paid the price. Now, 
we come near to God not in base of how much law we fulfilled, how much you know uh, letters of the law we fulfilled. We come by faith to receive what is already done because Yeshua has been made a cause for us, as it is written. Cause is everyone that hangeth on a tree. Brothers and sisters, it's so important to receive it. The same concept in Galatians 4, 4 to 6, and, sec and uh, Titus chapter 2, verse 11 to verse 15, the same principle. Number 4, he is our justifier. He is one of the offices he occupies. Now listen to this. Not only did his blood pay the price for our sin, the blood also has another benefit. And that's why Yeshua is the justifier. His blood wipes away every record of sins that we have confessed. If you have been convicted of your sins and repented of them and confessed them to the Lord, not only are you forgiven, you are justified. The blood wipes off the sin. There is no record of it in heaven above, on earth beneath, or in hell underneath. No record again. Justification results from this very act and that is why we are able to be free from sin consciousness when you are justified and the sin is blotted out no record of it you can have righteousness consciousness because righteousness is now imputed to us as a gift and once you can receive this you can grow in the lord if you are not able to receive justification, you'll be living with sin, guilt consciousness, sin consciousness. You will not be able to forget what you did that the Lord has blotted out and forgiven. And that is why it's important to receive this ministry. That's what makes it possible for us. As Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 says, If any man is in Yeshua, is a new creature, all things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And that's why the Bible says that he rose again for our justification. When you have time, read Romans chapter 3, verse 20, all the way to 26, and you see the power of justification. Yeshua is the, justific is the justifier of his people. Brothers and sisters, read Romans 4, 24, 25, and Romans chapter 5, verse 15 to 18, to see his role as justifier. Number five, he is master and lord in the kingdom church. He is the one who has a preeminent stature to whom all followers simply obey his instructions and live the way he did. In Matthew chapter 10, 24, the disciple is not above his master, nor the servant above his lord. It is enough for the disciple that he be as his master and the servant as his lord. If they call the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more shall they call his household? You see, as master, he is our Lord. So we exist to follow him. We exist to follow his footstep. And we cannot want to escape anything he went through. He went through taunts, they abused him, they insulted him, they rejected him. To be rejected, is a normal course of life of people who follow our master. Whatever he went through, as our master, we should embrace. That's why he said to us in Matthew 5, that when people persecute you and do all manner of evil against you, say rejoice and leap for joy. Stop putting a long face, stop worrying, stop screaming, because the master way, the master's way is the only way. And all these people who teach people things opposite to what the master did, you're not to be sure that on the last day, you're going to stand before the king, what you do teach the people. Number six, he is the empowerer of his church. He promised us that the same Holy Spirit he received at the baptism of John, with our measure, that we too will receive Holy Spirit to with which we can function on his behalf and do the work he committed to our trust. The Great Commission He's done his own part of redemption, the part of proclaiming this good news to people across the world has been given to us. And in John 7, 37 to 39, he says, If anybody is thirsty, let him come and drink, for out of our belly shall flow rivers of living water. It's so unfortunate that somehow some sections of the church have turned Holy Spirit and his power only into quest to speak in tongues, only. And then that's all. The only evidence of Holy Spirit in their life is tongues. 
That's such a weak expression of the Holy Spirit. Brothers and sisters, tongues are only merely to signify first that a higher personality has displaced a, a lower personality. That's why the tongues come when people receive Holy Spirit. It's an initial evidence that Holy Spirit has come in. The, and so tongues now come as a prayer language for edification, for building us of self in the Holy Ghost, as we're told in the book of Jude. And also, praying in tongues is very powerful. Men and brethren, it's so important that we get this right so that the enemy will not deceive us, so that the enemy will not cause us to be chasing the wrong thing. And therefore, he's saying, look, even publicly, don't speak in tongues before the church if there's no if you don't have the gift of interpretation or somebody in the church doesn't have the gift of interpretation keep quiet brothers and sisters exalting tongues above the power of holy spirit which is what he said in acts 1 8 you shall receive power after the holy ghost has come upon you and that power you receive will make you witnesses unto me from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria to uttermost parts of the earth. We've got to return this to the right order. Yeshua is the empower of his people. And he said in John 14, 15 to 18, If you love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father he shall send you another comforter who shall abide with you forever. Brothers and sisters, let's live in obedience. And the Lord is his good pleasure to release to us the same measure of Holy Spirit, so to say, for us to become exactly what he meant us to be and do the assignment for which we are meant to do. Number seven, he is model. He is our model. The Father set Yeshua in the earth rim to show us the way, the way to please the Father, the way to live. And as that model, the Lord allowed for people to write his biography. First, the official biographer Matthew. Secondly, John, close, intimate friend. Then Mark, who wrote from sources like Peter, his uncle, and Barnabas, his uncle, and his own mother, who was one of the deaconesses that served Yeshua. And brothers and sisters, Luke was a medical doctor, had a forensic analytical mind. He brought together from various sources and built a major profile of Yeshua, what he taught and how he lived. And so the father has let Yeshua be the model. How did he live? Yeshua came not to do his own will. John 4.34, his food was to do the will of the father. John 5.30, John 6.38, he said, I didn't come from heaven to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. Even at the garden of Gethsemane, Oh, there was this thought of what he would go through, the passion, the intense pain of being crucified, and he began to pray. The Bible says that the tears was as thick as blood. He prayed the Father, even in the face of that pain. He didn't ask the Father, just take it away. He said, Father, as a human, I see this pain. I get it. Would you kindly spare me this pain? The Father says, Son, that's why you came. You came to pay the price to redeem people like George, people like Elect, people like Anne, people like Stephanie, wherever you are, you were in that place. And he said, Father, nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. So Yeshua was a model of complete obedience to the Father, complete trust in the Father. He trusted the Father, and the Lord wants us to come and look unto him alone. That's why we are told in Hebrews 1 that the Father has made him the express image of his person. And in Hebrews 12 we are told, looking unto Yeshua, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. And he said, and at the right hand of the throne of Elohim, brothers and sisters, he is our perfect model. Let's look to Yeshua, not men of God, not women of God. Let's, the only way you can follow a man of God is that he is following Yeshua. That's what Paul said, follow me as I follow Yeshua. He didn't ask people to follow him blindly, to do whatever he wanted. No, he is the ultimate model. You need to follow Yeshua for yourself. You need to follow him as a model. You need to walk in his steps as we are told in First Peter chapter 2. Number 8, he is the great shepherd. The good shepherd. Yeshua 
is a shepherd like none. He cares for us in a holistic sense, spirit, soul, and body. And listen to this. He wants us to depend entirely on him. The good shepherd cares for every aspect of our lives. Want us to trust him completely, care for him. He's a present shepherd. He's not a far off shepherd. He's right there where we are. He said in John 10, 11, I'm the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. He has given his life and he takes responsibility to supply all that is necessary. We don't need to beg him. We don't need to try to be transactional with him. He said, no, don't be transactional with me. Seek for the kingdom and his righteousness. All other things, trust me, I will provide. Number nine, Yeshua is our high priest. He is the high priest of a particular order of priesthood. Not this present order you see people wearing robes and colors. That's the Levitical. And it leads to what is called the modern iteration of Levitical priesthood is called the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. In Revelation chapter 2, verse 6 and 15, Yeshua said, I hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans. This ruling the people, being there a boss, and people are kissing your ring and bowing to you and calling you my Lord, your grace. Human beings are calling you. I mean, saints are calling you my Lord, and you are accepting it, you are receiving it, you have a problem with the high priest because you are not part of his priesthood. His priesthood is called the priesthood after the order of Melchizedek. It's a simple priesthood. It's a serving priesthood. It's a holy priesthood. And he himself founded it. And that priesthood, of that priesthood, he is right there in the heavenly realm. The Levitical priesthood, his first chief priest, Aaron is dead, and his body is still in the earth realm. The Nimrodic priesthood, that rules people and crushes people for gain. You know what? Nimrod, long dead. His remains are now part of the dust of the planet. Eh, but Yeshua, when he finished his priesthood, he went to the heavenlies, and according to Hebrews chapter 2, verse 16 to verse 18, and Hebrews 4, verse 14 to 16, he sat at the right hand of the Father. What is he doing there? interceding for us he's continuing his priesthood he's praying for us he's interceding for us he's releasing grace when you are going through what are you going through look up to the priest the high priest of our profession and he has called us to a peculiar priesthood called the priesthood after the order of melchizedek he's also called the royal priesthood first peter chapter 2 9 and 10 talks about it and it's a priesthood of serving him and serving one another Brothers and sisters, don't get hung up on all these organizational models. The priesthood of Yeshua is different. Number 10, he is the supreme king of the kingdom. Listen to this. Yeshua Jesus is not a weak absentee leader who needs preachers and teachers to fill up the space for him. He does not engage in indirect rule like colonial nations. Rather, his plan and pattern is to rule directly in the hearts of all the redeemed as part of one united kingdom nation. All believers worldwide, notwithstanding their race or color or ages, notwithstanding their gender, all are to be subject to the king. He is supposed to re reign supreme in our hearts and that's why he calls on us to be his disciples, not disciples of men, not disciples of church, not disciples of uh, ministry, but disciples of Yeshua, the one supreme king of the kingdom, Matthew 16, 24. Then say ye, Jesus unto his disciples, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. Follow him to where? Follow him to die to self. And so that our vessels are totally at his behest. He can use our vessels to express himself any way it pleases him. And that's why, men and brethren, we cannot be loyal to anything. Spouse, children, parents, spouse to friends, spouse to... A I mean, there's nothing else that should take preeminence, precedence over him. Whatever it is, is an idol. And that's why the Lord wants us to truly imbibe the principle in Galatians 2.20 dead with Christ, so that our vessels are at his behest. And number 11, he is the sole access to the Father. 
There may be many roads to Rome, but there's only one road to the Father, only one access point, only one gate, only one door. John 14, 6, Yeshua said unto them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And this is so important that we proclaim this truth in love to all our loved ones that all the things they are trying, religious efforts they are making cannot take them closer to the Father because the Father has appointed one voice, one source, one access point to himself, which is Yeshua the Messiah, the express image of his glory, the brightness of his countenance. Number 12, he is the head of the body. His true church is pictured as an organic body with different functional parts designed to individually connect with him and be connected also to other body parts. If you look at Ephesians chapter 4, verse 15 and 16, where to speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, and then from him, where we grow up, we begin to minister to one another, so that by what every joint supplies, the body makes increase of itself in love. And Ephesians 5.23 says, For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. Men and brethren, he is the head of the body. Let's recognize that. And those who preach, please preach, let people know. They have a head, and that head is Yeshua Jesus. He's not the overseer. He's not the pastor. He's not the apostle. He's not the prophet. He's not the evangelist. He's not the pastor or teacher. It's not, the head is not the church you belong to. Your head is Yeshua. It will blow up the body of Yeshua for people to know this truth, to believe this truth and to walk in it, that we are part of his body. And that is why the Lord wants us to know he has given us various spiritual gifts so that we can function as part of that organic body. Romans 12, 3 to 8, 1 Corinthians, all of chapter 12, Ephesians 4, 1 to 10, 1 Peter 4, 10 and 11, and that makes it possible for us to render spiritual service to him and to one another as part of the body. And that's what the kingdom church is. We're going to be looking at this thing in detail. The kingdom church as an organic entity that connects right back to him. And that's why the Lord doesn't want us to allow anybody to deceive us, to create a church system that is based on organization and rituals. And that is why the Lord also intentionally gave to the church the fivefold to bring all these things into the realm of reality. If you read Ephesians 4, 11 to 16, it is the fivefold that their ministry collectively brings about an organic church image. And number 13, he is the groom of his wife, the church. The true kingdom church is the bride of Yeshua. The blood he shed at the cross is the bride price he paid for her. In Jewish law, you see somebody, you are convinced it's God's will for your life. You don't just go and grab her and go. You don't just go and do a wedding and go and live together. No, you go and pay a bride price. And with that bride price, that's your wife. She cannot marry another man, neither can you marry another woman. You are betrothed. And in that state of betrothal, you know what will happen? By the grace of the Lord, that betrothal means that there's a covenant. And that covenant is respected. Then you go home as a man. You go and prepare. Prepare a house for her to live in. Prepare the things with which she will live as your wife. And you know what? By the grace of the Lord, when you are ready, you now go. You have your dad put together a banquet, a marriage supper for you. And then that day, the people come with their daughter and then the marriage is officially joined and then the couple can go home and consummate their marriage. The day Yeshua shed his blood at the cross and said it is finished, that was the bright price he paid for the church. Everybody who receives grace to believe that that sacrifice was for him or her to be saved, you are now saved to be part of the bride. Thank you so much for being with us on this program and watching and we believe you learned something and the Lord bless you. Now it's time to connect with us on our social media platforms. We have a daily live stream on Facebook Monday all the way to Sunday every day. 
by about 10.30 a.m. UK time. And that's the same as Nigerian time. And you, it's either Apostle George Monday to Friday, uh, to Thursday, Pastor Grace uh, Friday to Sunday. And then in the evening of Sunday, we have two sessions from 5.30 to about 6, after 6, another one up to 7. So please join us on the live stream and you're going to enjoy it. We also visit our website www.gsom.ac to download free ebooks. This course you just listened to, all these lessons, you know, there's an ebook we have free of charge. Everything we do is free. But more importantly, you can actually do your program on, you know, ebooks. You can do your program entirely on ebooks and with this video or anyone you want you can also if you want to do the yes course or be do the master class you can go to www.kingdombooksclub.com and you can subscribe so that you can do it you can also subscribe to our channels this youtube gsom.tv and we also have a telegram channel gsom media you can send us an email at akclife.tv at gmail.com we love you dearly and we want to partner with you to make sure that the body of Yeshua, Jesus, is empowered with truth. Remember, it is the teach, train, equip, activate, and release paradigm. Absolutely free of charge. Have a blessed day and we'll see you again soon.